Kelly. I was actually really flattered to be asked to come because I think this is really fantastic series and um, I'm actually quite shy. <laughs> I hate doing readings, um, so uh, so only uh, an invitation from Stephen could get me to do this. But um, we have some uh, corollaries, actually, Dan. Um, I'm gonna be reading. Um, I'm Irish, so. Uh, Keeping with that Irish theme of heavy material, I'm going to be reading from my memoir that is about the loss of my first son. Um, I think we'll all make it through, though. Um, and, uh, and then the second thing that I'm going to be reading is some poetry um, that dip into theological themes. Is, um, they've been inspired by uh, some of the studying I've been doing, working on my Master's of Divinity um, at BU, which I'm almost finished. So. Yeah. Can you can you hear okay? Is it too loud? Too quiet? Louder. Louder. Okay. Yeah. How's that? Is that is that good? Okay. There's nothing more annoying than someone who's not speaking loudly enough. What? Say. Oh, Kate. My friend Kate's giving me some advice over there. So I'll be reading from uh, the blue poppy and the mustard seed. Stephen mentioned it. Um, a memoir of loss and hope, and it's actually um, it's a memoir of my time with my son, who was um, uh, born and unfortunately born very medically compromised and lived for seven weeks at home on hospice care. And also, there's a second narrative that runs through it as well of traveling around the world with my ex-husband. We actually kind of ran away and literally traveled around the world. And it's all really from a Buddhist perspective, because I'm actually a Buddhist and um, soon to be a Buddhist chaplain. Um, so, um, and Wisdom Publications is a Buddhist publishing house. So, it's, it's, um, it's about kind of traveling around the world, literally, and traveling through hard situations and grief and trying to figure out what that means. So, um, artful moments of ordinary days. And uh, there's an epithet at the beginning of the chapters. An artist wears her art in place of wounds. Patty Smith. Yes. <laughs> you will. Okay. Um, I think everything will be pretty self-explanatory as we go along. Uh, while we waited for Liam to die, we tried not to stop living. And like any new mommy, I wanted to capture those moments and hold on to them those elusive points of light that come together in the camera, captured to develop after the moment ha has been lost. Life is fleeting, the bulb flashes, the shutter blinks, and I'm comforted to know the impression will be with me. I can let go a bit, appreciate the artful moments of ordinary days, and enjoy them flashing by. We all want those keepsake moments of life. We all want happiness and not to suffer. We all want the spacious, at ease frame of mind that comes when we trust that two opposing thoughts can be true. Someone can be present with me and not here at all. Having nothing can be the same as having it all. Milarepa, a poet saint of Tibet, wrote in drinking the mountain stream that happiness, happiness is one and knows samsara and nirvana are not two. As if looking through a viewfinder of a camera, I looked at light differently now. Details were singled out and single, signal out. I looked at the narrative in the street scene in my life. I, lock, I looked into it rather than at it. I looked at the relief on the door rather than the house and the smile on the baby's face in the pram rather than the mother walking by. The camera shielded me and at the same time allowed me to feel drawn closer in. I took around 390 pictures of Liam and our two few adventures and ordinary moments together. The shutter blinked. We picnicked at Mount Tabor, which is the only active volcano inside a city's limits. From there, we had a view of Mount Hood in the distance. It was a rare, clear day. We stretched out in the grass of one exploded, unexploded mountain, and ate grapes and cheese and rustic bread, and sipped a beer looking into the distance at another unexploded mountain. 
For that day, we were just a family on a picnic in the sunshine. A high lama, her eminence, Jetson Kusha Chimilugi, sometimes called Jetson Kusha, came to town for a two-day teaching. I'd had a student-teacher relationship with her since I was 17 when I attended my first Buddhist teaching. I can't discern if it was the Mahakala or the Mahakali empowerment she gave, but either way, the merit gained is similar. They were the male and female aspects of the same deity who is a fierce protector of all the Dharma and the practitioners on the path. I really wanted Jetsun Law to give Liam a blessing, so we brought him to her teachings on compassion. I don't recall the exact words of the teaching, but I do remember a flash of realization as I sat on a cushion rocking Liam in his car seat. No matter if people felt we made the right or wrong decision for Liam, it was ready to accept the responsibility. I was his mother, and it was my job to protect him no matter what. His father and I did what no one else could do or would do. We thought it best at the time of his birth to intervene and deliver him by C-section and resuscitate him. We decided to intervene and give him drugs and to keep his heart beating in those dire first few days, and drugs to prevent seizures and tubes to take in food. And then we decided further intervention was denying him the opportunity to move past this suffering. We decided to protect him from suffering rather than death. After the teaching, on the second day, we took Liam to the front of the room where Jetsuma was sitting. We bought a kata, a white scarf, which we'd offer, and she returned draped over his neck for a blessing. We also asked her to give Liam a, a Tibetan Dharma name. She gave him her own father's name. She called him Kumba Namya, happiness or joy victorious. I hoped that she was right. I hoped for Liam and for us. Shudder blinked. We took him to the forest at Opal Creek and walked him through the, through the old growth. I walked slowly up the dirt and, and strewn leaves in climb because in my, post, in my second post-operative week, every step pierced me. Chris and I took turns carrying him and watching him watch the wide canopy overhead, a kaleidoscope of light and leaves that shimmered and hushed with the breeze. We rested in the low branch, branching elbows of trees along the trail. I made a miniature wildflower bouquet. We paused at a rushing fall. We were a family hiking in an oasis for that day, nothing more. Shutter blinked. We took Liam to Cannon Beach and walked against gently blowing sand, watching the waves crash against haystack rock. Our lifetimes keep rolling in and crashing on this shore of existence. The sky and the Willamette River running in the cold Pacific were shades of blue like the colors that swirl in the petals of blue poppies coming together to make astonishing results. Liam did crinkle his face a bit when the wind and sand blew at him. I was delighted that he noticed his surroundings at all and made a nest for him in my lap to shield him. There were clouds, but they were unpunishing puffs and drifting. In the pictures we took for that day, Liam was in our arms with our backs to the sea and we were smiling. Blink. On Father's Day, we thought we should go out. We went to Il Piato. That was a little elegantly appointed but comfortable neighborhood place offering perfect salt and boca pastas al dente with full sauces and complex wines to complement. It traditionally had been our celebrating place. We just definitely indulged. But that night I ordered something more comforting, risotto with smoked cheese and co colorful vegetables. I gave Chris his first and for the foreseeable future only Father's Day present. It was a slender silver cuff bracelet with simple stars stamped onto it. But that night I couldn't take in none of the goodness. The smoke of the dish was so overpowering I thought I might vomit. I actually kept looking over my shoulder to see if the kitchen was on fire. Something really had to be burning down for the wood taste to sit so heavy on my tongue. Mid-meal, Chris asked if I wanted to go, sensing my spark of anguish. I looked around the table at the three of us. Liam was in his car seat on the chair between us. I nodded. Yes, we have to go home. I can't do this. 
I can't choke down any more tears. I couldn't choke down any more tears. I thought I would explode in an embarrassing torrent even before the bill came. Chris paid. I carried Liam in his car seat out to the car and got in the back seat with him. Between sobs, I apologized to Chris for ruining his Father's Day. Blink. Bath time, a ritual. I avoid giving Liam a bath every day, like our hospice nurse had suggested when I told her I felt awful um, not being able to do something more. I told myself I didn't want him to get colder, to get a cold, or to get sick, sicker, or die sooner. But honestly, there was a deeper sunk fear and truth. I panicked a little in the, those warm baths where I held him floating between my legs. The way he stretched and arched his back toward the water, sinking his head down into the rims of his eyes and maybe beyond if, I, if I'd let him. His arms and legs unfurled a precious reprieve like tea leaves in a cup. I projected that he must think he's back in the womb. All the warm water must remind him of a safe place. He sighed when the water enveloped him. He seemed to enjoy it. We said he loved it. Perhaps it was me who loved to think that we could recognize the warm safety of the pre-birth days when everything was right and okay, or even recognize his current surroundings. I washed the warm water over him and over me but soon I was alert to the exposed parts of my body, what was submerged and what was not, and attuned to where the water's wake line sliced along my thigh, rendering insubstantial boundary lines separating warmth and cold water, air, life, blink, death, ordinary days, samsara and nirvana are not two. Lena, um, Go forward a little bit. That's to um, a piece that um, in the narrative when uh, we were traveling actually, and it's towards the end, and we were in Prague, which is an amazing, enchanted place um, that really spoke to me. Love it. <laughs> uh, turning wheels. A cut and the um, the epithet is accustomed as I had as I've been to contemplating both nirvana and samsara as inherent in myself. I had forgotten to think of hope and fear. And that's from a uh, poet named uh, Milarepa in the Tibetan tradition. Getting off the train in Prague station, I saw a woman walking quickly toward us. Before I could look away, I thought I saw a panicked look in her eyes. I thought she needed help. Maybe her kid was lost somewhere in the station, I thought. Opening my gaze to hers, I let her approach. You need room? She said, pointing to the map that had several circles drawn in it. I have good room, clean, good price. She pointed to one of the circles around Staro Mestaka uh, radiance. Oh, this square in Praha. No stay, just look. Just look, I asked, bumming my shoulder straps and hopping a little to help hoist my pack to tug the straps down tighter. I questioned the purse with my eyes. I have a metro ticket for you. She tried to entice us. I will take you there. If you don't like it, you say no, and still I pay for the ticket. Chris repeated the terms to make sure we had understood. If we don't like it, we don't have to pay? No, she nodded firmly. And you pay for the metro, I added? Oh no. Again, a firm nod. No, I asked, glancing at Chris. Her hand stood up in front of her, palms toward me. I misunderstood somehow. Yes, sorry, yes, yes. She pumped the air for emphasis. I learned later that Ano means yes in Czech. Chris and I agreed with what? With a what have we got to lose shrug of the shoulders. The conductor, the voice of the conductor had the cadence of the Bohemian folk dancer. The metro wasn't crowded. There was no other travelers like us that I could see. December must have been a slow month for tours in Prague. Our guide was silent, patting the air in front of her hip at each stop. Not yet, not yet. Checks boarded and deboarded, lips straight as pencils, shoulders hung low. The, conductor, the conducting voice sang out the same name of the stops. I recalled the words from a mistress from the map. Our guide sprung from the sliding doors and motioned for us to follow. 
darting between pillars and people. We followed her lead to the escalator. It was the steepest escalator I'd ever seen. I was forced to lift my chin up higher than I'd been able to muster for the last three months. The escalator felt nearly vertical as we rode up for the first time. In a row on both of the walls, all the way up, the narrow passage were dozens of frames meant to hold advertisements, but oddly enough and seemingly auspicious to me, they each held the same picture of the Buddha, long robes, stylized curls, and blue bindi knot, gazing and lips resting in expression of natural great peace. I was comforted to unexpectedly find him. Ascending, I passed through an honor guard of sacred symbols. I wasn't following the itinerary I thought I needed to, but I was on the right path. We rose to the surface while the golden glow of uh, Caprovalo street lights enveloped us into the amber fog night. Perliska Street and Dolma Street were laid out just the right angle so that as we walked west, St. Nicholas Church on the left and the old town hall on the right seemed to simultaneously step aside, extending like arms to hold open invisible gates as we enter Old Town Square, Saramastra Mall. Tin Church with her twin Romanesque towers topped with black peaks that were punctuated with golden stars reigned over the square. The fine dusting of snow glittering on top making it look more magical. The town looked like a fairy tale. I desperately needed a happy ending, since like most fairy tales, my tale also began with peril and misfortune. In the holiday market in the square, shoppers gathered uh, around great tin tubs of fresh fish. This is uh, flashing forward a couple of days, actually. They pointed, and the vendor, with hands that looked as tough as his leather apron, grabbed the desirable and clutched down just behind its gills that, that pumping staccato. The vendor clubbed it, gutted it, weighed it, and wrapped it in the day's old news. Fish was the traditional holiday dinner for Czechs. Children rode ponies around a ring, a living carousel. The children were swaddled in woolen coats, mittens, scars, and hats, the same bright colors of the large umbrella that covered the ring. Red, yellow, green, blue, a cosmic kaleidoscope on a simulated samsaric wheel. I watched for an hour or so and imagined Liam going around and around with the other children happy. On the other side of the square and town hall, I went one day to see an exhibit of photos, the chest, uh, Czech uh, press photos. Standing in front of the photos, I was so captivated, I felt the sad pain and tearful joy of all the people looking back at me from their still moments. I imagined the bulbs flashing. Flash, checks overflowed the streets smiling and holding flags. The women's hockey team had just won the gold medal. Flash, on a catwalk surrounded by blank faced spectators and naked women, women knelt in front of a man uh, at a sex industry trade show. Flash. Wedding, smiles, flowers in mid midair. Flash. Clinton met Hobble, the president writer of the Czech Republic. Blue shirt, red ties, extended hands, straight spines, and smiles of dignities, dignitaries with frozen smiles. Flash. God was raced for the cup, sails full. Flash, a World Cup match, a muddy muscular player suspended in the air, toes pointed down like a dancer, hair splashing up around the ball he had just headbutted. Flash, a woman held up a picture of herself taken before the man hunted her down in the streets of Bangladesh and doused her with battery acid that ate her flesh to the bone. In the, the picture that she held, her mouth was as straight as her long black hair. Her dark eyes were wide. Could she see the future? In the large photo before me, her hair was still straight, but her face was a swirling eddy of scar tissue and reconstructed flesh. Her mouth was half devoured by the bottle of acid in the hand of a man who tried to take her life and knew he'd at least take her prospects of marriage because he wouldn't take no for an answer. And yet, she smiled 
for the more recent photo and her eyes were brighter than before. Could she see a different future? Had that searing suffering transformed something else in her life? Flash, a baby's skin was velin, ribs protruding, belly and cheeks sagged solid, and eyes were set deep, cast in the shadow of his skull. Closing my eyes, the darkness only developed the image further. Liam was so thin in the days just before his death. His bones were hard against my hand, even though his clothes in, through his clothes and blankets. His eyes were sunken and dark. When his ashes were returned to me in a teeny box wrapped in a blue paper, that I wasn't surprised by how small the box was, but by how little it weighed. It was not heavier than the images that were hanging before me. It was not heavier than the album of photos of Liam, those photos I composed to be artful memories. Photos like the beautiful still lifes of the Dutch masters, who called them natural, the natural death. Still lifes that say as much about what is not in the frame as about what is there. In the end, Liam was not heavier than a thick book, maybe barely heavier than this one I hold. Flash, my pictures, flash, your pictures, flash, some exposures, some burn and dodge, same fix, still life, more natural, a life still, and yet still a life. genres because I did my MFA work in uh, literary nonfiction. That was actually my thesis. I was lucky enough to find publication for my thesis. Um, but I've been returning recently to fiction and, and poetry. So um, I took a class on um, apocalyptic literature. It was awesome. <laughs> we, we read a lot of Flannery O'Connor. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and I was really struck by um, the Book of Revelation, and I think it's such a powerful narrative, and uh, really trippy and cool. And um, so I, I started to experiment with um, some of the figurations and the characters and the symbolism in that. And um, the idea is to make a series of poems that um, are sort of reflecting and subverting the, the feminine um, aspects of wisdom and the characterizations and whatnot in the Book of Revelation, and then to have them in conversation eventually with uh, with Buddhist um, texts and extrapolating symbolism from there as well. So these are this is sort of the beginning of the series that really is just reflecting um, and playing with the Book of Revelation. So. Blessed is she that read and hear and keep in unity. Unity comes from the tree, throne and lamb, healing fruit and leaf, life and words flow, grace and peace. Nations, seals of seven, plagues will be undone and done, and ah, again, with seven spirits, almighty, which is, which was, which is to come, and ah, is keeping in those who hear and read deeply into the waters and woes and wait here in now. And the second one is, I was in the spirit. Seven cities, seven seals, signs, candlesticks, seven and gold vials opened. Many waters have voices, wings with vision and eyes. I was in the spirit all along. Seven trumpets blew, eyes were in the spirit and the ashy sweet song. Jezebel and woman clothed in sun, and deities with swords for tongues, and the spirit make done all undone. Um, another figuration of some chicks from the book of Revelation. <laughs> in the wilderness, women. Jezebel and women clothed in sun trade their mantles made by man, hang their names on beams of light, their violet and red and white pearls on branches of trees. 
Moon underfoot and in their eyes, crowns of stars veiling down. They meet to birth a new dance that they compel a red dragon and a lamb with them to keep the beat. Slung, some clothed woman and Jezebel, having drunk in all the saints, whirl naked naturally, shaking their boughs with twelve fruits and healing leaves, and come to compel to stillness the pains of the cities. Babylon, a new Jerusalem, yesterday, America, today, America, are here and now, Ferguson, tomorrow, just. The girls whisper matronly secrets in the lamplight of their hearts from the forest rooted in and between their heads. Lovely, loving, life waters alone flowing from their thighs in the wilderness of unknowing they know. And the final one is a little season that was done. Loosed a little season, season. evil has run its course. Resting yet a little season, the saints under the altar, loosed with the open fifth seal, want to know how long must they wait. Now is the new season. A little more time will tell a new tale. A little sea on run is now undone. By woman clothed with the sun, her tree of life sprung from the not mortal might and the meek, the throne and the lamb, the river and the tree.